Chiefs captured the Broncos and the Redskins scalped the Bears. It felt like an Indian summer inside the NFL. I'm Lisa Burkhart. On this week's cover story, we'll visit with football legend Tex Schramm, and we'll tell you why he's out of football. Hi, I'm Doak Walker. When I was with the Detroit Lions, I ran, I caught, I passed, and I kicked. Stay tuned in to see what I'm doing now. After a disastrous start, the Seahawks are very much in the playoff picture. Their quarterback, Dave Craig, joins us on NFL Crosstalk. This is Inside the NFL, professional football's most informative hour, with Len Dawson, Nick Fonacani, and Chris Collinsworth. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's show. Gentlemen, it's hard to believe that this regular season is winding to a close, and I find this year that the running backs are more involved in the game plans than in years past. Even the run-and-shoot teams know you've got to get good run production in order to win. When I look at the stats, there are four players that have reached the 1,000-yard plateau, and with three games remaining in the regular season, I'm sure there's going to be six or eight more that will get there as well. Now, Nick, I know you are reluctant to give us your opinion <laughs> on this show, but if you had your choice of any running back in the league, who would you take and why? Barry Sanders. He's the Detroit franchise. This guy can go from 0 to 60 faster than a cheetah. You have to go all the way back to O.J. Simpson to find this guy who can make someone miss like Barry Sanders can. Faster than a <laughs> cheetah. I like that. That's good. Well, I like Thurman Thomas of the Buffalo Bills. He's second in the National Football League in rushing. He's first in total yards, and he may not be the best receiver or the best runner in the National Football League, but I think he's the best back in the game right now. Give me Bo Jackson because he is that rare common nation of world-class speed and tremendous power. Every time he gets his hands on the football, those defenses hold their breath. But, Nick, there would be one stipulation. I would want him to play the whole year, not just half of it. Now, you put Neil Anderson in that group, Lenny. You're talking about the big names in the league, but there are some new kids behind the block that have entered the league in a real rush. Yeah, and the kids that you're talking about aren't necessarily first-round draft choices. Marion Butts of the San Diego Chargers was really brought in just as a blocking back. Derek Finner of, San of Seattle, he was a guy that was brought in and didn't even uh, have much of a chance until Kurt Warner left by Plan B Free Agency. And then you've got Barry Ward down in Kansas City. He was brought in just to give Christian Okoye a break now and then. You're absolutely right, but you can't make yards without the football. The young guys are getting it. So are some of the veteran ones. An example is Ernest Biner of the Redskins. He's got over 800 yards rushing. He wouldn't be getting the ball unless Gerald Riggs got hurt. His ex-teammate, uh, Kevin Mack of Cleveland, he is the only bright spot in a very dismal season. And where would the Giants be without O.J. Anderson? There's a combination of good young and veteran running backs. Lenny, what you're telling me is how important the running game is in the NFL. Because there are only a couple quarterbacks like Marino in Montana who can win without it. Yes, sir, folks. Without that running game, you are in trouble. That's trouble with a capital T now. Does that remind you of the musical, The Music Man, where 76 trombones led the big parade? And in the NFC's AFC Central, 7 and 6 leads the big division. I only bring this up because I can just see Sam Weiss as Professor Harold Hill marching not into River City, but to Riverfront. Since October, this stadium has been home to a world champion. Sunday, another world champ shared the jungle with the Bengals. But this team came with its heavy hitters in a minor slump. Joe Montana and Jerry Rice have been cold of late, and the Niners' ground game hasn't been strong. Is it possible San Francisco is in search of... Cincinnati was also in search last weekend of a win to remain alone atop the AFC Central and of revenge from Super Bowl 23. Montana's back there to throw. Looks, lobs it down the middle. Phillips intercepts it at the five. Montana has been intercepted 15 times now this year. That is his all-time high. 
The Bengals came out with a fired-up defense, and on their first offensive possession, they marched 70 yards for a score. Looking, looking. Now he's going to be around. Throws it into the end zone. Touchdown! In a game where Craig Taylor's catch would be the only receiving touchdown, this battle was shaping up to be one of offensive lines. Right in the beat around the bush. This is Pound Miller. Wherever he's at, Pound it. Or Bert. Pound Bert. It was becoming a battle of anger versus intellect, of emotion versus strategy. In 92, I should have slipped in. I should have slipped in. No, if they're in the gaps, me and you will take it. No, no, it's either slip out or slip in because if I slip out, and for much of the afternoon, cool heads and hot hearts would pave the way for a running bonanza. Santa gives the ball to Roger Craig. Left side, he breaks down to the Bengals, 45. Dixon finally pulls him down from behind. He said the 49ers running game getting well at the expense of the Bengals. San Francisco rushed for a season-high 202 yards, and when Harry Sidney received a trio of crushing blocks, the Niners had a 14-10 third-quarter lead. Sidney cuts outside. He's got the corner. Touchdown, 49ers. But both teams would run wild and gain more yards on the ground than through the air, and helped by the powerful running of Icky Woods, Cincinnati snared a three-point fourth-quarter lead. Since his injury last year, the Icky Shuffle hasn't been seen too often, but the Montana to Rice Tango is becoming a most familiar step. How many times have the 49ers faced this situation? This situation, the Montana has brought it back. Terry Rice to the right, two receivers to the left. Pass to Rice into the middle, to the 45, to the 40. He's inside the 35 and down to the 32-yard line. Plus, he makes the tackle. And how many times have they done that? Rice's catch set up the game-tying field goal, and in overtime, he continued his clutch play. Rice is all alone, and he will get up to the 32-yard line. Come on, can't have any of that. Jerry Rice. Out of the backfield, and motion goes Craig, and Montana's going to throw a quick shot. There it is, out the midfield. With Rice leading them deep into Cincinnati territory, the only questions left for the Niners were when and how to end it. Go! Kick it, field goal! Despite wishes of Bengal fans, the 49ers standard ending was inevitable. Let's jinx the center. Let's jinx Wesley Walls. Here's the kick. It is up. It is Seven straight times, the seven and six Bengals have fallen to the 49ers. For Cincinnati, last second losses to San Francisco have to be an ugly sight. Cincinnati's loss gave Chuck Knowles Steelers a chance to reclaim a share of first place in the AFC Central. And the schedule couldn't have been kinder. For the third time this season, the Steeler defense did not allow a touchdown. As an added bonus, the Steeler offense even scored a few. Looking for Green alone in the end zone, touchdown! Running back Merrill Hodge did the bulk of the damage, a two-touchdown, 175 total yard performance that dealt the Patriots their 11th straight defeat. And hands it off to Hodge. Here comes Hodge over the left side. 35, 30, 25, down the sideline, staying in bounds. He's all the way down, goes into the end zone. Will they give him the touchdown? They do. He stayed in bounds all the way, knocking people down. For Steeler head coach Chuck Knoll, the win was number 200, making Knoll only the fifth man in history to reach that lofty plateau. Cleveland head coach Jim Schaffner would settle for win number one. But last Sunday in the Astrodome, Schaffner's beleaguered Browns were limited to just one winning moment. Metcalf cutting left to the 15, across the 20, 25, 30, back to the middle to the 35, 40. But Eric Metcalf's magic came in the middle of a record-setting Oiler outburst during which Houston scored six touchdowns and a field goal on their first seven offensive possessions. It doesn't get much better than that. Sprint draw for White, looking for running room, has it now. He has a five, yes, score, touchdown! Oh, what a run by Lorenzo White! 
The central figure in this explosion was Lorenzo White, who became the first Oiler since the great Earl Campbell to rush for four touchdowns in a single game. To make matters worse for the Browns, the Oiler defense joined in the festivities. Has time, throws over the middle for Mack. Ball comes out of his hands. They say it's a fumble. The Oilers have it. It's Kennard. Down to the 40. No! Field. 40 yard line. He is going to score. That's a touchdown for the Oilers. Terry Kennard on the fumble return. Houston established new single game team records for points scored and first downs. And their eight touchdowns equal the Oiler marks at a 1962 against the New York Titans. But most importantly, the win gave Houston a 7-6 record and a one-third share of first place in the AFC Central Division. The only team in the AFC Central not 7-6 is the Cleveland Browns, who are suffering through a 2-11 season a year after an appearance in the AFC's championship game. Needless to say, Nick, terrible season for the Browns. Analyzing that situation, what would you do? Lenny, our model is at the crossroads as the Browns' owner. It's my opinion, either he go out and get a football man like George Young, or he sell a team to someone who will go out and get a football guy to make the tough football decisions. Yeah, I agree. There are a couple examples of decisions that were made within that organization that no football man would ever endorse. One of them was the trading of Ernest Spiner, who I think was traded because of the fact that he fumbled in a championship game. The other was the firing of Marty Schottenheimer, who, in my opinion, did more for the Cleveland Browns organization than anybody since Paul Brown. You know, Schottenheimer, what he did was provide stability for that club, and after two coaches, they haven't been able to do that. On top of that, Kozar has had five offensive coordinators in six years, and people say, what's the matter with Bernie? On top of that, trades and the draft the last three years, with the exception of Michael Dean Perry, has been terrible. The confidence level of that team is at an all-time low, both the players and the coaching staff. It it doesn't look like a quick fix situation. But Nick, if you were going to fix it, what would you do? Well, Lenny, if I was Art Modell, which he, I know what he'd like to do, he'd like to hire Bill Walsh, but so wouldn't everybody. Walsh is not going to Cleveland. He should hire, hire Howard Snellenberger. Snellenberger's been a winner every place that he has gone, and he has learned an awful lot since he was the coach of the old Baltimore Colts. But the bottom line is, unless Art Modell is willing to relinquish control of the football operation, no top-notch football man is going to come to Cleveland. Knowing Art Modell, that is going to be unlikely because, unlike so many owners, this is not a hobby with him. This is his life, and he's had two serious heart operations the last couple of years, and I just hope that his passion to win a Super Bowl doesn't jeopardize his own health. Traditionally, the NFC Central teams play such a tough physical style, they became known as the Black and Blue Division. Last week, however, these teams took the punishment instead of dishing it out. Call it the aura of the black and blue division, if you will, but even casual affiliation with the NFC Central seems to bring out the beast in anybody. <laughs> Clearly the loudest growl from the Lions' den has come from running back Barry Sanders. Last Monday night against the Raiders, Sanders seemed intent on restoring the roar in Detroit all by himself. Sanders exploded for 176 rushing yards and two scores as the Lions jumped to a 24-14 second period lead against L.A. Quarterback Rodney Pete ran for one touchdown and passed for another, proving that the run and shoot has bark as well as bite. Ferocious as the Lions' offense is, their defense is the worst in football, a fact not lost on L.A. quarterback Jay Schrader who riddled Detroit's secondary until they were black and blue. Number 83, Willie Galt, caught the Lions napping on the Raiders' first possession, turning their snooze into six points. Schrader then followed with two more touchdowns, finding open targets in Mervyn Fernandez and Tim Brown. Brown's first score in more than two years put L.A. ahead to stay, and then the Raider defense went out and defanged and declawed the Lions for good. Bo 
Jackson highlighted L.A.'s biggest point explosion of 1990, giving the Silver and Black a league record 29 victories on Monday Night Football. When it comes to prime time, the true king of beasts are the L.A. Raiders, while the Lions are last place also Rams in the NFC Central Cellar. After fighting their way back into the playoff picture, the Minnesota Vikings knew the gloves were going to have to come off against the Giants. But the New Yorkers did not seem ready for a brawl as Bill Parcells' painful kidney stone added injury to the insult of back-to-back -back losses. Get back, look at a throw. It's Sims. He's in the end zone, and they've got him. They get Sims in the end zone. The crowd goes dead quiet as the Vikings take a 2 to nothing lead on a safety here at the Meadowlands. Things were looking black for the Big Blue until first aid arrived in the form of defense. After spotting Minnesota a 12-3 first half lead, the Giants shut down the Vikings, limiting Jerry Burns' team to just seven yards of offense in the final period, allowing the New York offense to grind out 13 fourth quarter points. With Otis Anderson smashing over the career 10,000 yard mark and the Giant defense dishing out punishment, the Giants showed their NFC Central guests exactly where they could find black and blue. The 23-15 win wrapped up the NFC East title for the Giants, allowing them to unwind and savor the glow of a division title. The glow is one the Bears are already familiar with as kings of the black and blue division. Mike Ditka has brought the Bears back with defense and ball control. And when they met the resurgent Redskins last Sunday, something had to give. Each team took turns frustrating the other, and the number of collisions and pileups made the game broadcast sound like the police radio. But the advantage looked to belong to the Bears, who stymied the Redskins by building a nine-point lead thanks to five Mark Rippon interceptions. Although the Redskins receivers were less than helpful, Rippon continued firing and produced the game's only touchdown. Rippon is back in the flat for Clark on a crossing pattern at the five times. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. Clark's touchdown was good news for Skins fans, but the best was yet to come. Harbaugh takes, gives to Muster, loses oh, 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 the ball. Oh, 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 come on, Still up for come Clark. On. Inside the 30, the Redskins oh. recover. The first fumble of Brad Muster's career became the break the Redskins needed to squeeze out the win. Fourth down to three and a half yards to go. Here's the snap. The placement made. The kick by Mo Miller. Rises to the upright. And the Redskins have the lead. It is good. The 10 to 9 win had the Bears singing the blues and gave Redskins fans an early Christmas present. But if you think the only jolly old man was an RFK, you should have been in Milwaukee where the Christmas spirit was alive and well as the Packers gave the Seahawks a 20 to nothing lead that lasted into the fourth quarter. A straight hands off on a slant, now center breaks it to the outside, cuts in, he's at the 10, jumps over man to five, at the goal line, touchdown Seahawks! But in one of the most improbable rallies of the season, reserve quarterback Blair Keel, who had not thrown a pass since 1987, brought the Packers back. Field is on the run for his life, on the run, fires it upfield, and a touchdown to Perry! He's going to bootleg to the right. There's a man wide open. Touchdown. And it goes to Eddie West. And they've scored. The cardiac pack lived again as Green Bay kicked off, trailing by six points. This time, and he pooch kicks the ball down the field. It's taken at the 28-yard line. Oh, no! But it was not to be, as the Seahawks escaped their black and blue encounters slightly bruised, but with their playoff hopes intact.
Last season, the Seattle Seahawks finished with a losing record for the first time since 1982. This year, Chuck Knox lost Kurt Warner to Plan B, Steve Largent to retirement, and 63 pounds to Ultra Slim Fast. And he also lost his first three games in what looked like a rebuilding season. But then ground chucks started flying high. Dave Craig beat Kansas City on the final play of the game with this pass to Paul Scanzi. And the surprising Seahawks are flying high, having won seven of their ten games. They're right in the thick of the playoff chase. One reason is the play of steady longtime quarterback Dave Craig, who joins Chris today on NFL Crosstalk. Thanks, Lenny. And Dave, we appreciate you not overdressing for this affair today. Well, thank you, Chris. I knew you'd appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, Dave, talk about a flair for the dramatic. The Seahawks have had eight games decided in the final two minutes this year. How's your heart holding up? Well, uh, the older I'm getting, the harder it is to, to be able to handle these type of games. But uh, as long as we keep winning uh, the majority of them, that's, that's okay. They've been pretty close for the last four or five games. You know, well, the Seahawks, you guys started this year with the run and shoot, but then you switched to a more conventional offense. As a quarterback, what did you think of the run and shoot, and why did the Seahawks abandon it? Because we played the Chicago Bears the first game of the season. <laughs> I think that's one good answer. Um, we just didn't start off with it that well, and uh, we decided to get back into our normal routine. We still utilize the run and shoot on occasion, but uh, we don't use it as a, you know, a major basis for our offense. Well, it wasn't just the first game that you guys had problems with. You know, you started off 0-3, and, and most fans tended to forget about the Seahawks. After that first month of the season, what did Chuck Knox do to turn your team around? I think the best thing that Chuck did was uh, to let us know that he was still behind us, that, you know, we had a little tough streak at the beginning of the season, but to still hang in there and, and stay together as a football team. And I think he did a good job of keeping us all together, plus the coaches and the veteran leadership we had on our team kept everybody together, and uh, good things have happened to us since then. Yeah, you know, Dave, it seems, though, that every year people in Seattle are talking about looking for a new quarterback for that club. Do you ever get frustrated with the lack of respect that you get? Only from the reporters that keep asking me those questions, Chris. <laughs> uh, it, you know, really, it doesn't bother me that much because I know I have to go out there and do my job. If somebody better comes along, then they'll, they'll take, my, take my position out there. But so far, I've just been doing what I've been asked to do and, and trying to do the best of it. And that's what I did when I got my job, and I'm still, still doing it 11 years later. Well, you sure are. You're doing a great job this year. But let's talk about your playoff possibilities for this year. You have Miami on the road, but then you finish with Denver and Detroit at home. Can the Seahawks complete the turnaround and make the playoffs? Well, we'd like to think we can. We know we have a, a difficult task of going down to Miami and playing uh, the Miami Dolphins. They're having a tremendous year this year. Their defense is playing extremely well. They've got a running game to complement Dan Marino. So they've got everything you can ask for in a football team down there. And we just have to go down there and do what we've been doing, play good, solid defense, run the football, complete some passes, play special teams, and uh, you know maybe we'll pull another last-second win. Who knows? Let me ask you about a guy that's really helped your ball club this year and probably a little bit of a surprise to you, and that's Derek Finner. He's really almost come out of nowhere and uh, helped your ball club get in the playoff hunt. Well, I'm very proud of the way Derek Finner has played this year. He's had a lot of things that have happened to him to get into the NFL, and now he's got his chance and he's made the most of it. Uh, you know, I'm very just happy about the way things have turned out for him. He's become you know, more mature as a person and uh, as a football player. He's just been doing everything and more that we've asked of him this season. All right, Dave. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to be with us, and, uh, and really, that outfit looks terrific. <laughs> thank you very much, Chris. Nice talking to you again. Nick, Lynn? Chris, thank you. Nick, what do you think of this David Craig? Lenny, I can't believe that he's taken every snap from center this year. In that game against Kansas City, he gets sacked nine times, seven by Derek Thomas, but yet comes up off the turf. The last play of the game throws the winning touchdown pass. He's a tough cookie. He showed me something. He showed me the type of competitor he really is because a lot of quarterbacks would have bitten the dust after nine sacks. If Seattle gets to the playoffs, I think it's going to be because of David Craig. They called the Cowboys America's team but it was really Shram's team. Tex is the subject of Lisa Burkhardt's cover story. Many call Texas E. Shram the most powerful man in pro football. For decades, he symbolized everything that was glorious and great about the Dallas Cowboys. And throughout his career, there was hardly a change in the NFL that Shram wasn't involved with. But if that's true, then why is Shram here in Key West, in the middle of football season, fishing on his boat? It's difficult to even comprehend that Tex Schramm is out of football, uninvolved with the Cowboys, removed from sports, but he is. And to understand why that is, you have to take a close look at the amazing career of this very amazing man. I think I've always had 
an insatiable imagination and um, a desire to do things new, uh, a desire to, a real desire to be an innovator and the confidence to make it work. Early on, Tex had successful management careers with the Rams and CBS TV. But when he was named GM of the Expansion Cowboys, he found the perfect and essential complement to his brilliant innovations. And that was Dallas owner Clint Murkison Jr., a man who would provide Schramm with an open pocketbook and complete freedom in running the team. The most important thing was having Clint Murkison from the beginning under other circumstances, I don't think I would have had a prayer. Murkison gave Schramm unprecedented autonomy, and Tex took off. He hired Tom Landry and pioneered the use of computers in drafting players. He initiated the merger between the NFL and Upstart AFL. And as chairman of the league's competition committee, Schramm was the guy responsible for visible 30-second time clocks, sudden death in regular season games, rule changes allowing blockers to use their hands, the use of microphones by officials, moving the goalpost to the back of the end zone, putting flags on the goalpost, and the ever-controversial in the grass and instant replay rules. Meanwhile, back in Dallas, the Cowboys put together 20 straight winning seasons, and Tex created the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. Schramm did make some enemies along the way. There were run-ins with Dwayne Thomas, Tony Dorsett, and Leroy Jordan. Tex could be brutal in his use of power, and he enraged most of the NFL during the 1987 player strike by supporting the so-called scab games. If you're going to go to war, you better, you better win the war. And uh, I think that our, uh, our charge at that time was to uh, get the players playing. Schramm won that battle, but there was little he could do to improve his team's fortunes. The Cowboys were losers by then, and when outsider Jerry Jones bought the team last year, it fell to Tex to announce Tom Landry's dismissal. It's tough when you break a relationship that we've had for 29 years. Unlike his predecessors, Jones took an active role in the Cowboys' operation, and there was no place for Schramm. Two months after Landry was fired, Tex left, but he embarked on a new venture, one that seemed ideally suited to his abilities, the startup of the World League of American Football, an NFL offshoot. I foresaw a truly international league that would uh, play a role, a major role, in international sports. And I felt to do that, you have to do it all out. You, you can't do it with reservations. Tex wanted to run the WLAF like he had run the Cowboys with complete freedom. But instead of having Clint Murkison Jr. as boss, he found himself answering to a whole slew of cost-conscious NFL owners. They envisioned a small operation, a sort of minor league for the NFL to prevent the upstart of rival leagues. Schramm clearly wanted more, and he was let go in October. So Tex is out of football, a victim of his enthusiastic nature. He won a lot, he made some people angry, but he left an imprint on the game he loved so much. And you have to wonder if he's finished yet. I enjoy being in the arena. Maybe I'll have to find a new arena. Tex was known as the second most powerful man in the National Football League. That's because of his relationship with Commissioner Pete Rozelle. They have been very close ever since Tex brought him into the National League and made Pete the PR director of the Los Angeles Rams. You know, but there's no question that Tex Ram did a great job for the Dallas Cowboys. But the one thing I'll never forget about Tex Ram is the way that he personally set out to try to destroy our players union back in 1987 during that strike. Lisa's piece hit one thing right on the money, and that was the fact that the players did indeed hate Tex Ram during that strike. But being the kind of guy that I am, I'm willing to forgive and forget and Tex we want to wish you well recovering from that back surgery. You're right, Chris. Tex is a tough guy, but there is a place for him in the National Football League as a consultant. You know, there are some teams who really could use it. Look at the New England Patriots, Victor Kayam. He's grasping for straws, looking for direction, and I think Tex can help put him on the right road. As a consultant, yes, but don't give him the whole show to run because you know how he loves to spend money. These owners are spending over $100 million for the franchise, and I think they're rather reluctant to turn their checkbook over to Tex Schramm. Hey, maybe that's why he's not the president of the New <laughs> World League. I mean, the owners thought that Tex was moving a little bit too fast, and his ideas may be a little grandiose for an NFL minor league. Well, I guess you can say what you want about old Tex, but I've always found him to be a very interesting character and someone who's done a great deal 
for the National Football League. Sometimes teams, coaches, and cities have a jinx over certain opponents. For example, Marty Schottenheimer had never beaten Denver. Buffalo usually has trouble in Indianapolis, and the Rams have historically had problems with New Orleans. These are the makings of an NFL nightmare. It is believed that in a bad dream, you always wake up right before you're going to die. So with their playoff life on the line last Sunday, the Rams try to shake themselves from their season-long nightmare. Back up is Everett. Over the top, intercepted at the 49. And all the way down the sideline is the New Orleans Saints, Brett Maxey, and he'll take it in for a score. Despite Brett Maxey's theft, the Saints were still last in the league in interceptions, so Jim Everett continued to dream big. Here's Everett. Double pumps. He lets it go deep. He's got a man headed toward the end zone. It is complete. The Rams led 17 to 10, but went right back to sleep in time for the really scary part. On a truly nightmarish third and goal, Pete Holohan made a great catch, but forgot to cross the goal line. L.A. settled for a field goal, and the four points they lost would come back to haunt them. As head coach John Robinson watched his postseason dreams, Fade away. Third down about two. The Saints at their 39. Down by 10 points to start the final quarter. Here's Kennedy to the left. Slips outside. Gets the first down. He's at the 50. He's at the 45. He can go all the way. He's at the 30. He's at the 20. Kennedy at the 10. Good blocking for him. He goes into the end zone. Standing up. It's a great run. Walsh, the quarterback, drops back into a shotgun set. He's got a man in the end zone. He's wide open. And there's the pass. And it is complete. New Orleans kept its wild card hopes alive in the NFC. But in the AFC, the Denver Broncos had long since given up such dreams and desired only to play out the season in peace. In Kansas City, they had other ideas. After looking up at the Broncos in the AFC West standings for seven straight years, the first place Chiefs would go to great lengths to show them how it feels at the bottom of the pile. Derek Thomas and the league-leading Kansas City pass rush sacked John Elway five times. And the old-fashioned Chiefs offense added a new wrinkle. Hand off to a Koye. Pitches back to the bird. The flea flicker. And a long pass down the middle. He's got Page at the one. He slides in. Still, the Broncos are always tough in the first half, at least, and build a halftime lead for the 11th time in 13 games. Elway. Runs out of the pocket to the right, being chased. Cox's his arm, throws in the end zone. It's caught. Touchdown, Denver Broncos. Unfortunately, the Broncos are better at building leads than protecting them. Back to pass, Elwood. He stands ahead. He stops and guns a pass up the middle. Trapped by Sharp after the catch. The ball jarred free. It's loose. It's a fumble. Kansas City's got it back. Two third quarter fumbles halted Denver's offense, and its defense couldn't halt the Chiefs. No, that's not the Nigerian nightmare, but Barry Word, the freewheeling free agent who led the Chiefs to three second half touchdowns and their fifth win in their last six games. Here's the fake handoff to Bird, wants to throw, lost it in the end zone, caught, touchdown, Kansas. The Broncos' road to the bottom has now featured eight losses after they had led at halftime. As the easy riding Chiefs left them to wonder painfully what a long, strange trip it's been. In Indianapolis, Ron Meyer must wonder how he can snap the Colts out of their Hoosier haze. It takes a creative mind to outplay Marv Levy's Bills, but you can't fault the Colts for experimenting with an approach that may have been a little flipped out. In the end, though, any hope the Colts had of manhandling Buffalo was truly a psychedelic idea. And defensive end Bruce Smith brought them back to reality. The Bills stacked their line with blitzing linebackers, forcing the Colts linemen like number 73's of Frost Moss to leave someone unblocked. Number 11, Jeff George, the NFL's top draft pick, then got a lesson in how to handle the blitz from Jim Kelly, the NFL's top-rated quarterback. Here's an all-out blitz, a handoff to Terrence at the 20, 15, 10, 5, he won't go on Oh, they caught him in the blitz, and ran up the middle with Carmen, Carmen, Thomas. The out of the shotgun to throw, long down the middle, reach, got it, at the 5, in for the touchdown. 
Buffalo played turnover-free offense, and the Bills' defense held the Colts to 127 total yards. And as winter draws near, the Blizzard defense has become the rest of the AFC's worst recurring nightmare. Coming up, Where Are They Now? features Hall of Famer Doak Walker. We'll have more highlights, including the Dolphins-Eagles overtime thriller. And on Pigskin Potpourri, a look at some NFL players' favorite clubhouse activities. Somehow I get the feeling that our upcoming Pigskin Potpourri feature about players' favorite clubhouse activities is not going to include talking to Gary Myers or any other reporter for that matter. Well, Lenny, I can say that talking to moody football players isn't always <laughs> high on my list of things to do. Probably in Cleveland's locker room, they don't want to talk to anybody because they have to answer questions. Now, you said you're going to keep abreast of that situation. Jimmy Schaffner was a teammate of mine. He is 0-4 as the interim coach. You said maybe he'd get a chance if he did well. What about now? Well, I said if he won four or five of his games, he'd have a shot. But after they lost 58-14 to to Houston the other day, even Schaffner questions his qualifications to be a head coach. I spoke with Brown's owner, Art Modell, earlier this week, and he said, yes, he'll probably be looking for a new head coach after this season, but Schaffner would have a job in the personnel department, and he'd also have a key role in helping him find a new coach. Well, in talking to Art Modell, did he mention who he might be talking to? Well, he said he's going to wait until after the season to really search out a candidate, but he has talked with Ed DeBarlo to ask him about Bill Walsh, and Walsh really seems to be milking his availability for all it's worth. But I don't think Walsh is going to Cleveland. More likely, it would be somebody like Mike White, the quarterback coach for the Raiders, or John Robinson is reports that he might lose the power struggle with John Shaw with the Rams and maybe go to Cleveland. I think the best candidate right now is Louisville's Howard Schnellenberger. He coached Bernie Kosar at Miami. Kosar has had five quarterback coaches in six years with the Browns. Schnellenberger is a guy who can really settle Kosar down. You know, we were talking about that situation earlier in this program, and you and Nick happened to agree on something. <laughs> he said Schnellenberger is the man to change things around for the Browns. But I have heard in the past the reason that Schnellenberger is not back in the NFL is the fact that he wanted control much like Don Shula has at Miami. Would he get that control in Cleveland? No. In fact, if he wants to be a coach in the NFL, he's going to have to coach only and forget about total control. Let's talk about the New England Patriots. We seem to be talking about these people all <laughs> of the time. What's the latest on them? Well, University of Miami Athletic Director Sam Jankovic probably will be offered the job to be the director of football operations within the next two weeks. Jankovic has been calling his friends in the NFL to ask him their advice on whether or not he should take this job because it really is right now a terrible situation and they're all telling him if you want to be in the NFL take this job now the big question is how many changes will Jankovic make and that directly ties in to Victor Kayam's financial stability if he wants to change everything it's going to cost about five million dollars GM Patrick Sullivan definitely is gone and that's going to cost about 2.2 but if he wants to get rid of the whole coaching staff and the scattering department that's close to another three million dollars from what I understand Rod Rust and the coaching staff, or at least part of the coaching staff, will stay for at least another year while Jankovic figures out what's wrong with the rest of the organization. Do you think that Kayyem's willing to give up that kind of money to, to get this man? No, which is why I think that Rust will stay at least another year. You know, let's talk about the quarterbacks. I like talking about quarterbacks. They put in the in-the-grass rule to help them. There's talk about getting rid of that. Are there any rules coming in that might help the quarterback? Well, Lenny, one of the most subjective rules in the league right now is intentional grounding. If you watched the 49ers Giants game a couple weeks ago, you saw Montana and Sims ground the ball about two or three times each during the game, and it was never called. From what I understand, in the Pro Bowl this year, intentional grounding will be made legal as a means really to protect the quarterback because they only have a week to get prepared. But it is more of an experiment. If it works, it will be in the league next year. No, oh, I won't go for that. It took me about seven years to learn how to intentionally ground the ball without being detected. <laughs> Gary, thank you very much. See you next week. Okay, Lynn. The Detroit Lions dominated the NFL in the 1950s with four division titles and three championships. Under head coach Buddy Parker, these teams were led by Hall of Famers Bobby Lane, Jack Christensen, and the subject of our Where Are They Now? halfback, Doak Walker. The territory may be different, but these days, Doak Walker still cuts as impressive a figure in the saddle as he once did on the gridiron. Riding the high mountain trails of Colorado reminds him of the summers he spent here as a boy, far from the football frenzy he stirred up at home in the Lone Star State. As a schoolboy, Doak starred as half of a dynamic duo with teammate Bobby Lane. It was the beginning of a lifetime partnership that went well beyond the football field. We grew up together. We shot dice together. We played cards together. Uh, we shot a throw with nickel at the line together. 
Uh, we'd gamble on baskets, how many baskets we could make. Uh, Bobby was one of the greatest competitors I've ever been around. We had a feeling then that it'd be pretty tough to beat us if we could <laughs> both play on the same ball club. But the war sidetracked their college game plan. Dope decided to go to SMU, Bobby to Texas. And it was Dope who became the golden boy of the Southwest. He set three national scoring records, led his team to two conference titles, and won the Maxwell and Heisman trophies. Dope could run, pass, catch, kick, and even play defense. He was always in the game. I don't see how players today can go in and play a down and come out and then wait two downs and can go back in and play one down. I had to play full time to, to get a feeling of the ball game. After Doak graduated, the Detroit Lions, in a clever move of matchmaking, teamed the three-time All-American with his partner Bobby Lane. Together, they led the Lions to three divisional titles and two NFL championships. Any every move I was going to make, regardless of where I was or what we were doing, I felt a lot like Bobby did. We never got beat. Time just ran out. And uh, we had great confidence in ourselves and plus Bobby that uh, we could score any time we wanted to. It was just a matter of when we wanted to play together and get it over with. Named All-Pro four times, Doak was one of the greatest all-around athletes to ever play the game. He was still in his prime when he decided to leave pro football at the end of the 1955 season. Returning to the Colorado mountains of his youth, Doak eventually settled in Steamboat Springs. After 21 years of working for a large contracting firm, he now enjoys an active retirement, but he still remembers why he played the game. We played because we loved the game. Today's player, uh, uh, sure, I know some of them love the game, but maybe some of them are playing for money, too. Doak is still the all-around athlete, enjoying Colorado's many outdoor pursuits, fishing, hunting, and golf. But this is a ski town, a sport he's appreciated much more since marrying former Olympic skier and member of Steamboat's premier ski racing clan, Skeeter Werner. The combination of skiing honors and football awards makes an impressive display in their living room. But the Heisman Trophy will soon be joined by a new college football prize, the Doak Walker Award. I'm very proud to have an award named after me. Um, and it, this award is not only the top running back, but it's also a scholastic award. This athlete will have to graduate within a four to five year period. A fitting tribute to a man who loved the game and whose achievements will stand tall in the history of football. At a news conference last Friday, Greg Walker, a senior at the University of Washington, was elected as the first recipient of the Doak Walker National Running Back Award. This award will be presented annually to one of the nation's outstanding collegiate running backs. Now, all I know is, folks, any award in which the winner exhibits the sportsmanship of a Doak Walker is high praise indeed. Nick, you know Doak Walker and his lovely wife, Skeeter, and you also know, after everybody knows now, the relationship that Doak Walker and Bobby Lane had ever since their high school days. Lane, I'll tell you what, they had a very close relationship. Matter of fact, people would know that any time that you carry pictures in your wallet, normally they're of your wife or your children, not Doak Walker. He carried a high school picture of Bobby Lane in his wallet for 40 years. Now, you talk about a close relationship. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I don't know what's so unusual about that, Nick. Uh, ever since I started the show, I've been carrying around a picture of you in my wallet. So <laughs> it's no big deal. <laughs> All right. No. But uh, have you guys noticed that every time we do a segment on uh, Where Are They Now?, from your guys' era, that they're always riding a horse. What is it? I mean, <laughs> you do should, you have a horse? Are you, you out should there understand riding? that. Understand that when somebody rides on your back for so many years in the National Football League, when you retire, you just like to ride on somebody else or something <laughs> else's back for a while. But Bobby Lane, Doak Walker, the greatest of friends. Last week, two old friends met for the first time as head coaches. Cardinals Joe Bugle and Falcons Jerry Glanville were both coordinators at Western Kentucky back in the mid 60s. There was another matchup in the NFL last week where the coaches were not old friends, but new foes. Don Shula certainly has many friends in the NFL, but don't count Buddy Ryan among them. 
Ryan had angered the Dolphins by kicking a meaningless field goal in the final seconds of a preseason victory. So with revenge as motivation, Miami came out flying right from the start. On the strength of Tony Martin's first quarter touchdown, Miami opened up an early 10 to nothing lead. But then over aggressiveness on defense managed to deflate the pumped up Dolphins. Cunningham the pass, fires, it's complete to fires for a touchdown. That ball was within a hair of being picked off. Tim McTire looked like he had an interception. Just didn't watch the ball sufficiently as Byers did, who was Rick Sensor. After stealing a touchdown with his quick hands, Keith Byers faked out Miami with some sound execution. A fourth quarter safety blitz by Jarvis Williams was negated when Byers convincingly sold the run on this flea flicker. Cunningham slips it off to Byers. Flea flicker back to Cunningham. Loads up, going deep. Racing with the football cap and Williams. With Buddy Ryan, you can always expect surprises, but oddly enough, in the fourth quarter, it was Buddy's Eagles who were ambushed by the Dolphins. Dan Marino throwing for over 300 yards for the first time this season, rallied the Dolphins twice in the final five minutes to force overtime. There, ironically, the Eagles' kicking game, so precise in preseason, was suddenly grounded. Eagles 33, low snap, fielded, and somehow kicked away off the ground, rolling across the 50, the 45, the 40, and a penalty flies way back at the 20-yard line. I guess you can't kick that. Moments later, Pete Stoyanovich sent the birds packing, and Miami got sweet revenge. Here it is. It's spotted. The kick is away, and the kick is... Like Buddy Ryan, Jerry Glanville has a way of looking down on his head coaching peers, but not with Joe Bugle. These two are old college coaching buddies. Perhaps that's why last Sunday's Cardinal Falcon game took on a more collegiate complexion, say, California Stanford, 1982. Good. Go Scott Campbell, three wideouts, make it four wideouts, back to throw Campbell, setting up, pressure coming, throwing far side, intercepted, it's picked up, Cedric back with the ball. All the way up to the 30 inside. Breaks one tackle, laterals again. It's the same play as a week ago, and Marcus Turner's got it. And Turner this time will be tackled inside. The While the Cardinal defense looked to improvisation, quarterback Tim Rosenbaugh stuck to a more traditional way of scoring points. Phoenix overcame an early three-point deficit on Ricky Prohl's 45-yard touchdown reception and then put the game away when Marcus Turner disdained the lateral and made a beeline for the end zone on this fourth-quarter interception. Quick snap to Campbell from the shotgun throw it, and it's intercepted. It's picked up and running to the ball and taking it in for the touchdown. Our Cardinals and Marcus Turner. The improving cards earned their third straight victory, but with Atlanta mired in a six-game losing streak, it's apparent that these two friendly foes are head coaches heading in different directions. The Phoenix Cardinals have a modest three-game winning streak. They may not be in this year's playoff picture, but I believe they're going to be a force to be reckoned with in the near future. Chris, in the NFC East, there are four teams still with a chance to the playoffs. Cardinals don't happen to be one of them, but they are going to be playing three of those four in the next three weeks. Yeah, they're in a position to be a spoiler this year, but really they should still be in the playoff hunt. You go back to their season this year, they had two games in which they had a nine-point lead against the Giants, an 11-point lead late in the fourth quarter against the Packers, blew both of those games. If they had won those two games, they'd be 7-6 and six right now and controlling their own destiny as far as a wild-card spot goes. You know, I haven't heard too many people tooting Bugle's horn lately. Ooh. Wait, wait, but, wait, wait, wait. Tooting <laughs> Oh, all right, okay. <laughs> but the Cardinals really are in an envious position. They have two rookie running backs, Johnny Johnson and Anthony Thompson. Together, these guys have run for over 1,200 yards. Fantastic. You put these guys behind an offensive line that they call the Big Birds. The reason for that, Lenny, is because they average almost 300 pounds. Uh -huh. And you have to figure, in 1991, this team was going to be a contender. There's another ingredient to that puzzle. You have mentioned that's the quarterback. And Tim Rosenbaugh, if he continues to improve like he has, he's the quarterback of the future. He and David Gregg are the only two quarterbacks in the league to take every snap. And he can run with the football. He's got over 400 yards rushing. The only one with more 
is Randall Cunningham. So the future looks very bright for the Cardinals. Lenny, you know, you win three ball games in a row like the Cardinals have done, and you go into that locker room, and boy, what a pleasure it is. Everybody's smiling, and things are hunky-dory. But we players also know that we spend a lot of time in that locker room. Matter of fact, it's called our second home. So we need a little diversion, as you will see in this week's Pigskin Potpourri. The Denver Broncos pass the time in the locker room shooting hoops. The team has set up a row of baskets like you see in bars, only of course these games are free. And after the season the Broncos are having, maybe management will begin to charge them to play basketball. The Houston Oilers have made it up their own diversion. It's called Ballmaster, and Bruce Matthews is considered the number one player in the world at it. The object of the game is to make your opponent miss the ball after it bounces before the white line. It can be as hazardous as football. The Seattle Seahawks have a much tender and safer pursuit. It's called cribbage. Yes, a card game they play to relax. It's a little more complicated than Jim Rummy, but several players on the team have really gotten involved with the game. They better watch out because some players get into it so much that they play cards instead of study their playbooks. But it does help the players get their minds off the game as they try for the third wild card spot. Well, I'm glad that we didn't have these diversions because we may not have won two Super Bowls. Chris, I don't know, did you have this so-called diversion? All I remember is we, we met, we ate, we met, we practiced and I went home. Did you have any? Well, maybe that's why we lost our two Super Bowls. <laughs> you know, we used to play wiffle ball home run derby. If you hit a shot between the goalposts, it was a home run. And I used to be the king. I'm telling you, I was like Daryl Strawberry, like Jack and those strikeouts. Oh, right. You know no, what? No, you no, know no, what Bo us. Jackson's uh, diversion was to relax before a baseball game, mm. to get his bow and arrow out and, and shoot the thing. Can you imagine the Raiders out there if they said, "Let me try that"? You know, they wouldn't have enough people to suit up for the ball games on Sunday. All right, let's. Take Take a look at last week, folks, and how the selections came out. Well, well oh, you know, oh my, you know. two weeks I lost in a two row. overtime games. How about for, is man. it getting closer oh, for no the excuses. season? Do we have a race going, folks? Do we have a oh, race? We well, do. sort right. of between <laughs> Chris and myself, anyway. Yeah. Last. <laughs> all right. Now here are some of the games that we all agree on. Washington should have no problems with New England. San Francisco, the second time around, will defeat the Rams. Cleveland, folks, good news. They're going to win <laughs> against Atlanta. Dallas over Phoenix. Denver downing San Diego. Minnesota over Tampa Bay. And now for the rest of the games, a big, big game coming up. Interconference game, Buffalo at the Giants, Nick. No, I should pick the Giants. I like the Giants. I like their defense. But I love Buffalo's offense. And I like Bruce Smith and the way they're playing. I'm going to pick an upset. Buffalo over the Giants. Oh. Yeah, me too. Giants undefeated at home. But I really believe we have finally found a representative from the AFC that can play. I like the Buffalo Bills. Now, are you guys voting this way because of your hearts or <laughs> no, what you really you think? You know, no. how can you go against the Giants defense? Can't you mentioned any worse. <laughs> seven and oh at home. I am, I am going with the Buffalo Bills. All right, Chris, Cincinnati and the Raiders in another big game. Yeah, big concern here is Boomer Esiason. I saw Boomer earlier this week. He pulled a groin in the game last week, and he may not be able to play. But, but. I still think the Bengals can piece together a little running game, played a great game against the 49ers. I like the Bengals. Uh -huh. well, I like the Raiders. I like the tandem of Bo Jackson, Marcus Allen. I don't like their defense. They're not playing solid, but I still think the Raiders will win at home. The Raiders do have outstanding personnel for that defense, and I look for the Raiders to handle this and defeat Cincinnati. All right, we've got uh, Green Bay at Philadelphia. Well, the Eagles have lost two in a row. They're not going to lose three in a row. Buddy Ryan's going to ride them hard this week. Randall Cunningham, a big game. I like the Eagles. Yeah, they lost two in a row, but both of those games on the road, the Eagles are a different football team at home. I like the Eagles, too. Well, Green Bay has been up and down, haven't they? Mikowski, I think they really do miss that guy. I like Philadelphia. Houston at Kansas City. The old run and shoot coming to Arrowhead, Chris. The run and shoot dies in the cold. <laughs> I don't think it can happen up there. I think this is the beginning of the end of the Oilers and the run and shoot. I like the Chiefs. Well, you know, the Houston Oilers, Lorenzo White, had, yeah, Lorenzo White had a big game last week. Warren Moon, a great quarterback, but they're going up against Kansas City, and that defense, too tough at home. I like Kansas City. You know, Kansas City's got some problems in the secondary because last week, Albert Lewis, uh, Deron Cherry, and Kevin Ross all had to leave the ball game with various injuries. They're going to need all the secondary help they can get, and I think they've got it. I like Kansas City. Indianapolis at the Jets. Well, the New York Jets have had a week off, Lenny. <laughs> Bruce Coslett seems right. to get those guys rested, but they can't find a quarterback. Eric Dickerson will have a big day. I like Indianapolis. The Colts have beaten the Jets six out of the last seven times and the Jets have lost four in a row, so that means 
I'm taking the Jets, of course. <laughs> Bruce Cosell will have them ready. Well, that's your old coach. I'm going with Indianapolis in that ball game. Pittsburgh at New Orleans in an interesting contest. Really a big matchup as far as the playoff picture is concerned. But I've tried to win a football game before down there in the Superdome of New Orleans. I like the Saints at home. I don't think Steve Walsh can throw against that Pittsburgh Steelers defense. It's too good. Sound offensive running game by the Steelers. I like the Steelers. Make the running game you mentioned, they got it going last week. That's what I like about that. Pittsburgh over New Orleans. Seattle at Miami. Hey, Seattle won a lot of games real close, yes, but Miami at home, they're just too tough. Danny Marino, that look in his eye, he had that win. John Arfadell, the best game as a linebacker I've seen all year. I like Miami. The Seahawks will still make the playoffs, but they lose to the Dolphins this week. The Dolphins only lost one time at home this year. I like them. Does anybody have the look in their eye for Seattle, I wonder? <laughs> I don't think so. I like Marino and Miami. We've got Chicago at Detroit. Somehow, the Lions always seem to find a way to lose, and I think they're going to do it again. The Bears' uh, secondary, a little banged up. But I still like Chicago. Hey, Barry Sanders, that offense can put points on the board. Harbaugh is struggling. The offense of Chicago is not playing well. Detroit in an upset. Whoa. Detroit in an upset. I like the way you go, Nick. I don't like your selections <laughs> but that, but I like your attitude toward it. No, I like the defense of Chicago to win that one. All right, that does it for this week. Be sure to join us next week for Inside the NFL. Hey, we're going to be shuffling off to Buffalo to spotlight the Bills in their big game coming up against the Miami Dolphins. This game could determine who will have home field advantage in the AFC. So, for Nick Bonacani, Chris Collinsworth, I'm Len Dawson. Thank you for joining us on HBO's Inside the NFL. Back in the 60s, we were the first soccer star kickers in the NFL. Watch out for next week's Inside the NFL to find out where we are now. of HBO Sports, the network of champions.